Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening at the National Keratoconus Foundation Evening Webinar. My name is Gloria Chu. I'm an optometrist in Los Angeles at the USC Roski Eye Institute, and I will be your moderator for this evening. Before we start with our talk, I would like to give you some background on our very esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Luis Sclafani. She is a graduate of Illinois College of Optometry and began a 25-year career at the University of Chicago, retired as Associate Professor of Surgery and Director of Optometric Services. Since 2017, she's been the Vice President of Professional Affairs at Synergize, the company that makes hybrid contact lenses. Her job duties there include training doctors and students on how to properly fit contact lenses and advising company leadership as well on patient vision needs. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, has been awarded the status of diplomate by the American Academy of Optometry, numerous awards, so many, I can, definitely cannot list them all. Uh, she's a frequent lecturer and contributor to professional journals. In 2008, Dr. Sclafani was awarded the Illinois Optometrist of the Year and was named one of the top 10 females at the forefront of optometry. Um, she maintains a private practice in the loop of, on the loop in Chicago. She, you know, she's done so many things. Uh, she is an advocate for women in the profession and serves as the chair of Women of Vision, an organization dedicated to mentoring female optometrists. The list goes on and on, but we really wanna hear from her tonight. So the topic of today is hybrid contact lenses for the treatment of keratoconus. And we are very, very lucky to have Dr. Sclafani here. So I am gonna turn it over to her and I did wanna remind all of you to please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box. Those questions will be reviewed and at the last 15 minutes or so, we will answer as many of them as we can. So Dr. Sclafani, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I am very excited to hear your talk on hybrid contact lenses and particularly how it relates to our keratoconus patients. So take it away. Thank you so much, Gloria. It's uh, an honor to be here tonight. Um, you know, one of the things you forgot to mention was that I am a hockey mom and we were just having that discussion. So I always... did. How could I leave that <laughs> off your millions of accomplishments? <laughs> it is one of my my favorite uh, my my favorite things in life. I'm still taking care of my son who plays at University of Dayton. Um, but I was uh, the the team doctor for the Chicago Blackhawks oh. for five years. So uh, well, I did. You're a uh, chef too, and you're animate. preparing to make St. Patty's Day dinner. <laughs> I am. I am getting ready for that too. So, um, but it really, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Mary Pruden for inviting me to do this as well. Um, you know, the National Care to Conus Foundation has been very dear to my heart for so many years, uh, taking care of patients at the University of Chicago for so long, um, being in the trenches and, and sometimes making that diagnosis, but definitely taking care of the patients. So after we've made it, um, has really been easy for me because there are so many great resources and, and being able to hand them the brochure or send them to the website uh, so that they know that there are others out there who have this condition and that there um, is a lot of help and resources for them. So um, it really is an honor to, 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 very much so. I've done a lot of speaking in my career, but to be honest with you, the best time I have is when I get to share my passion uh, for keratoconus with those patients who experience this. Um, and as, as many mentioned, you know, I was I still see patients in um, in private practice on the south side of Chicago in the South Loop. I also teach at the Illinois College of Optometry. Um, but you know, I take my my years of experience and I brought it to industry, and that is, uh, I am now vice president of professional affairs for Synergize, where my goal is to educate doctors so that those doctors can uh, better be equipped to take care of patients who have keratoconus. 
So I'm going to discuss very briefly about the prevalence and the importance of early diagnosis of keratoconus. Then we'll dive into the history, the definitions, and the indications for using hybrid contact lenses for patients with the disease. And then we'll talk about um, a little bit about the fitting of hybrid lenses in, in patient care, because I know that's really important. Many of you are very familiar with the de definition of keratoconus, and it's a, dis a clinical term that describes a condition in which the cornea thins out, and because of that thinning, it starts to protrude. And so when we take care of these patients who have keratoconus, we know that they have high amounts of astigmatism that is present on their uh, front surface of their eye. And so it's very important to have tools available to us so that we could get rid of that corneal irregularity. Now, some of the challenges of treating keratoconus is diagnosing it early, um, and so that we are very equipped to not only guide our patients through, you know, different treatment options, but also, you know, be, have an understanding of what's going on. We know that there are many challenges, and when we take a visual acuity on our patients, you know, we don't just write down 2020 or 2030 or 2040. We also listen to the way you read off the, the letters that you're seeing on the chart, because that gives us a little bit of a dive into what you're experiencing as well. We know that uh, patients who experience keratoconus either early before it's diagnosed or with spec with glasses will have some double vision um, within, within a one eye. Uh, they have ghosting. You, your eyes might get tired and sensitive to light. We know that there are halos. But more importantly, we know that it's ex you experience this every day of your life. Every waking moment, we have a comment here from a keratoconus patient. Every waking moment, we use our eyes. So every waking moment, I'm reminded of the struggle. And so I just want to let you know that we doctors who take care of patients who have keratoconus, we're with you along that struggle. And we want to be partners with you when we're trying to decide on what type of contact lens or treatment plan for you. So we're, you've, got, you've, got team, you've got a team around you. So, but bear with us because sometimes it is challenging to make that diagnosis of keratoconus, especially early in the disease. So one of the things that doctors look for is if there's a big difference between astigmatism between the two eyes, is, um, if there is a, a, a family, oops, I'm sorry, family history, I went a little too far there, <laughs> or if there's a family history of keratoconus, this is very important. We'll talk about that in a moment. And more importantly, though, if there are a lot of changes in your glasses prescription, if we start seeing that that's happening or if you're going from doctor to doctor because you're just not getting satisfied with your um, spectacle correction, that, may, that is a clue to us that there potentially is keratoconus there. Now, we know that keratoconus is a sight-threatening disease, and I have to tell you, when I first started practicing in 1989, we estimated that there was probably one out of every 2,000 patients might ex be experiencing that, but uh, keratoconus, but we know that the prevalence is, is much stronger now or much more, uh, more, more uh that evident. Um, one, when I first started practicing and I would have to make that diagnosis, uh, patients would ask me, what's going to happen to me, doc? And, um, you know, I would have to tell them about one out of every five patients who has keratoconus will probably need a corneal transplant, which is extremely serious. But I'm happy to say that today in 2023, that number is a lot less. It's usually, it's less than one out of every 10 patients probably needs a corneal transplant. And the reason why is because patients are diagnosed earlier, doctors are more aware of how to di make that diagnosis, and more important, the treatments are much more obvious for patients or, or much more prevalent. We have new contact lenses, uh, we have cross-linking, and so we have lots of different opportunities to keep you from needing to wear contact lenses. I'm sorry, to keep you from needing a corneal transplant. We also know that it's more um, uh, the forefront of the news as well because of some athletes, some well-known athletes who have keratoconus. Here's a picture of Tommy Pham, a b baseball player with Ed Bennett, who is a big proponent and fitter of keratoconus. But we also know that Steph Curry um, uh, has keratoconus and he, uh, he uh, attributes wearing um, scleral lenses for re reversing his shooting slump. And so we know that it's, it can affect anyone anywhere. 
And one of the reasons why the prevalence has changed, um, as, as I mentioned before, is, is due to a more awareness, but it's also because of different uh, st research into looking at the prevalence. In fact, a, a, a national registry in the Netherlands predicted that there was one out of every 375 patients actually has keratoconus. So it's more obvious than we thought. There are some prevalence ranges from other countries, uh, Israel, one out of 50. Um, so the actual prevalence, if you looked at it worldwide, is per more like one out of probably a thousand worldwide, or at least that's reporting. Um, and there's, it could have to do with the environment. It could have to do with genetics. It could have to do with variations in population or how they're looking at it. But we also know that there's a huge difference in the way it's picked up, the different diagnostic criteria, but also the instruments that are available in your doctor's office to pick this up. And I bring this up because, you know, when we look at a care patient who has keratoconus and very early um, in the in the disease, um, it's the cornea looks very normal. In fact, Jay Krashmer, a professor at the University of Minnesota, wrote that he's been frustrated in his career because the cornea is so clear. Uh, it's supposed to be a clear tissue, but it doesn't mean it's normal. And so many early keratoconus patients have very normal looking uh, corneas when we look at them behind the microscope. It's only when we take a deep dive using other instrumentation that we might pick it up. This is what a keratoconus patient might look like later on in the disease. And you might be very familiar with some of these terms or, that your doctor might use. Um, this little, there's an iron ring called a Fleischer ring, this uh, arcuate kind of ring that uh, where copper, I'm sorry, where iron will build up on the cornea at at areas where there's a junction of curvature change. Um, that's pretty obvious on some on when we're behind a microscope, but maybe not so much to you. Uh, what we do want to prevent is scarring from for forming, and scarring will occur if the contact lens is not fit properly, and so it's, that's why it's very important for different contact lenses to be available and for doctors to understand how to fit that lens properly on you so that you have a clear window, so you don't develop a scar in which we can't fit. And then there's a condition called high drops, which I'll show you in a minute, but this is bottom image on the bottom. And unfortunately, it's, it's a painful condition. However, it does resolve, and sometimes it makes it easier for us to actually fit you in a contact lens, so, do, so don't despair. There are some external findings, I kind of call them party tricks that some of our patients can experience. And when they, uh, for example, this Munson sign, that's when a patient looks down and you can see how their lid kind of angulates because of that pointy cornea. Um, you can shine a light on one side of the cornea and it reflects onto the other side. It kind of focuses, that's called Rizzuti sign. But I like Sclafani sign and Sclafani sign is one of the most common ones. And that, that is a patient who comes in with that bag of glasses and patients are upset because they've had numerous contact lens, I'm sorry, eyeglass prescriptions and they're unhappy. And it's really upsetting when they get fancy glasses like uh, fancy designer frames. And so it is up to us when we start seeing that trend or if you are experiencing that trend or a family member that you make sure that you're getting the right diagnosis early. So one of the things that we've also known is there's this, there was a global consensus on keratoconus recently because, again, we're seeing the prevalence and the numbers on the rise. And so doctors wanted to see what's going on in the whole in the world with regards to keratoconus. Why are we seeing so much of this? Do, are, there, are there any associations? We know that there's some associations with certain conditions like neurofibromatosis, some autoimmune diseases, obesity, uh, sleep apnea, floppy eyelid syndrome, as you see here. Uh, where the lid averts, um, and even al allergies. Um, but we also know there's also genetic components. Now, I love to look at this picture. This reminds me all the time. Doesn't this guy look like the guy from Mayhem, that insurance kind of guy? But rubbing and itching your eyes or rubbing your eyes is a very bad thing to do for patients who are at risk for keratoconus, either because they have the genetic makeup or they have um, uh, other, other reasons why they might develop keratoconus. But we know that patients who rub their eyes often do that because they have allergy. Um, and so they're doing that, but they rub it so hard and with so much pressure that it causes a lot of uh, increase in the temperature of the eye, as well as increase in pressure, hence causing that thinning and that protrusion. And so it's really important that uh, you tell your kids no rubbing of the eye, or when we suspect a patient might be developing keratoconus, we keep them from rubbing. 
There's also an association with uh, snoring or sleep apnea in keratoconus. In, in fact, keratoconus patients are almost twice as likely to have sleep apnea. So it's really important and about, and sleep apnea is in about 9% of patients with keratoconus. And again, it may have to do with a patient's um, a predisposition to also have that floppy eyelids. So when we look at the corneal profile on a patient, you know, we could again see that protrusion and we take a look at the patient as a whole when we're trying to decide what would be the best treatment modality for that patient. What type of contact lens would work for that patient? So looking at that profile, as I just showed you here, looking at the side of the eye, we could also look at it in an instrument with a, such as an OCT. Now, some doctors will have this in the office. It's not necessary to have it to make that diagnosis. It's kind of just interesting for us to share with you um, that it's it, when we look at this patient, which is kind of like, think of it maybe like as a CAT scan a little bit. We look at the very first picture all the way on the left, somewhat normal looking cornea, uh, maybe a little bit of protrusion, but that middle image you can see has it, uh, that profile of that cornea, you could see where that cornea is most uh, protruding, we call it an ectasia, or where it's bulging the most. You can also tell that it's actually thinner in that region too. And so that's very classic of what we see with cornea, with keratoconus. This image all the way on the right is that what I was alluding to before, it's something called hydrops. What happens is the back surface of the cornea um, breaks and so fluid rushes into it and that's why you get that white looking cornea and it lasts for a few months but eventually the body likes to heal itself it seals it up itself up right away and eventually that fluid will go away and sometimes patients will end up with a, a cornea that's actually easier to fit and it's actually easier to fit on patients um, with different designs after afterwards now, unfortunately, high drops is also associated with mitral valve prolapse. And so if you do experience high drops, you need to make sure that you work with your doctor and your, your primary care doctor for them to evaluate this, this heart condition with them, with you. So let's look at two different types of corneas, because once you understand what the cornea looks like, you could see that what kind of lenses are uh, options for them. The eye on the left, you could see almost looks somewhat normal. And it's only when we look at the patient using a machine called a topographer, which actually is like a map of the cornea. It tells you where there's the peaks and where the valleys are, where there's a bump or where there's a depression. There, where there's bumps are hot colors like reds. And so if you look at the picture on the right, you could see that that cornea, obviously much more protrusion on that cornea and those hot number, those hot uh, map, on the red colors on the map below it really give it away that this patient does have a more moderate to advanced form of keratoconus as opposed to the patient on the right, um, I'm sorry, on the left where it's a much more uh, lesser degree of keratoconus. Now, it's important to look at that front surface, and of course, as the disease gets worse, you know, we can, we, it gets even more prevalent to see. But the topography that we often use only looks at the front surface of the eye or where the boat is, where the ship is, okay? And we can only see so much. And tomography is another instrument that we can often use. It also tells us what the back surface of the cornea looks like. And that's really important as well, because if your doctor suspects that you have keratoconus, or if you have a family member who has keratoconus, you might be someone who is should have both of these tests done. Um, and it's, it's very important because we'd like to make this diagnosis of keratoconus as early as possible so that we can give you different treatment options. So the top surface sh only shows those maps, whereas a tomographer shows you both the front and the back surface, those bottom maps there. And those bottom maps tells us what's going on in the back of the cornea as well well as how thick the cornea is or how thin the cornea is. The reason why I bring this up is because I work, as I mentioned before, very proud to work at the Illinois Eye Institute or the Illinois College of Optometry. And there has been a study that's going on looking at uh, keratoconus in children who are in uh, from the ages of seven to 18 years old in the Chicago public school system. And they either failed a school screening or they had known vision problems. And they screened over 3,800 eyes. And they noticed that there was over almost 7%, over 7% of these kids were at risk. 
They then did that test that I was showing you about, the tomography that I talked about, and they dived into the data a little bit deeper, and they showed that 8% of them were, um, had, were, were, sus were suspect of having keratoconus, or they were at risk. And uh, about one in, in 71 of these kids actually did have keratoconus, or had had the diagnosis of keratoconus. So the reason why we bring this up is because if we can catch these kids earlier uh, in the disease, we could treat them earlier with different uh, contact lens options, or as well as for cross-linking, which I'm sure is another topic of discussion, which is a procedure that will kind of stiffen the cornea so that it doesn't proceed to the later phases. And we also know that um, that that patients who um, have a family member are at an even greater risk for developing keratoconus. And this was one of the largest uh, multi-ethnic genome study um, in the world. And it had over 115,000 eyes that it looked at with 4,600 who had keratoconus. And they found 36 regions in the human genome that coded for keratoconus. So we do know that there's a high risk factor in your, if you have, if, in your family. And so younger kids should, or kids should be tested or looked at much earlier if they have a family history. Unfortunately, when um, our good colleague Andy Morgenstern did a survey and asked keratoconus patients if their doctor even asked about family members, not enough of them did. So I do want to urge you, if you do, um, you know, have keratoconus, that you ask your doctor if it's so, it, when when you should bring your 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 child in or your sibling in for uh, an evaluation. Now, the reason why it's so important for us to know um, what ab about the uh, uh, the different phases of keratoconus is because we treat patients differently with their contact lens options. As the disease progresses, we have a different continuum of how we treat our patient. Our patients, you know, develop keratoconus slowly. They don't wake up like this. And just like one doesn't wake up nine months pregnant, we wake up or we, we have a slow progression of the disease. And early in the disease, again, we can treat them possibly with some soft contact lenses or with spec or glasses. Um, but but we can also treat them with hybrid contact lenses. And as we progress in the continuum of the disease, we would move on to advanced treatments such as scleral contact lenses. So soft contact lenses can be used on patients who um, can see well in glasses. So if a patient who has keratoconus can see in glasses and it's stable, then a soft contact lens might be um, indicated for this patient. Or some patients might not have um, visual demands that require very astute vision, and so they're satisfied with the quality of vision they get with a soft contact lens. And we all know that soft contact lenses are very comfortable for, for, men, for most patients. Moving on, though, if a soft lens does not treat that patient, the, the standard of care are corneal gas permeable lenses. And corneal gas permeable lenses range in size from about 8 millimeters to maybe 11 millimeters. Remember, the cornea has about a diameter of about 11 to 12 millimeters on average. So the top lens uh, patient has a corneal GP that's a little smaller, and then we get bigger. They have very good optics and in many cases, very stable optics, but they have to be fit properly because if they bear onto the cornea, if they're touching the cornea too much, a cornea can develop scarring. And as I mentioned before, scarring is what makes the patient need uh, a corneal transplant. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. They're easy for patients to handle. They're unlimited powers. And um, they're very, very, very successful patients. I still I still fit corneal GPs on many, many patients and, and have been following them for over 30 years. They're also inexpensive and they're very reproducible. So they have really good benefits. So soft lens has the benefit of comfort. Gas permeable has the benefit of the better vision um, and hopefully is, is, is comfortable too. But there comes a point where sometimes a gas permeable lens just doesn't give that comfort that a patient is, is satisfied with. But it reminds me of this wonderful patient who I've been seeing for over 30 years now. Um, she is a keratoconus patient who I hadn't seen for about a year and a half, which was kind of surprising because most of our keratoconus patients are seen on a six month basis just to make sure they're doing okay or seeing if we need to modify the fit. Um, but she had undergone bariatric surgery and she had lost about 150 pounds. And so when I called her name in the waiting room at university, I was really shocked because I didn't recognize her. She had lost all this weight 
great. She had a beautiful outfit on, her hair and her makeup was done so beautifully. And um, she was a beautiful woman to begin with, but she had really tried to make some changes in, in, her, in her appearance. And so, but she also did this. She um, was a corneal gas permeable lens wearer, but she self-prescribed this uh, colored contact lens that she purchased at the gas station, um, which is illegal, of course. And um, this happens in Chicago quite often. And she put it on because she wanted to have that beautiful, you know, colored look to her eye, this uh, opaque colored look. Um, but then she could see out of the contact lens. And so she put her hard lens on top of it. Well, this is actually a system called piggybacking or tandem fitting. And, you know, she was somewhat mildly successful with that, except for the fact that this lens was horrific and her eye was really red um, because the lens didn't give enough oxygen. So I refit her in this piggyback or tandem system and it worked well for her and she was very satisfied and we kept her from needing a transplant. You could see a mild scar there, but she could see quite well out of the system and did very, very well. So that's the concept of, you know, tandem or piggyback fits and it has to be done. You can't do it with colored contact lenses because or you can with some, but not the one she was wearing because it didn't offer enough oxygen. And so it was hurting her eye actually, but it is a, a successful fitting system. And uh, patients use uh, a daily disposable lens uh, for the soft lens, and then they use their gas permeable lens, but that does require two different contact lens uh, care systems for these patients and two lenses and the expense of two lenses as well. And so going along with that concept came the idea of a hybrid contact lens. Um, so a hybrid contact lens it combines that soft lens skirt with the scent on the outside, and the center of the lens is actually a gas permeable material. So the gas permeable material provides the crisp optics of a hard lens. It neutralizes that irregular astigmatism from the cornea, and then it provides a skirt that, or a soft set, a soft contact lens that makes helps with that lens center properly and provides better comfort for that patient. So hybrid lenses um, will, again, gives you the, both, the, the benefits of both, and it could be used to fit either normal corneas or irregular corneas, like a keratoconus patient. It could be used for nearsightedness, farsightedness, normal astigmatism, and even bifocalness or presbyopia. And there are different hybrid lenses that are used for different stages of the disease. This is an article that was uh, written last uh, about a year ago by Tom Arnold, and it's like talking about hybrid lenses as the best of both worlds. Um, you know, hybrid lenses have an identity crisis to some degree because they're a gas perm lens, but they're also a soft lens, and one could also even call them a scleral lens because they sit on the sclera. So they have all of these different benefits to them. They, um, Erickson and Iogi were two scientists who saw that benefit of piggybacking. And so in 1984, they came up with the Saturn II hybrid lens. And then from 86 to 89, that soft perm lens came out. Now, that's about the time that I graduated from optometry school. And I have to say that in 1989, some of those lenses were not fitting well on patients. There were some complications with them. And so they kind of went, went off a favor for a while. But then in 2005, Synergize came about. Out, and they were the first, they are the hybrid contact lens company um, that came up with the first generation gas permeable uh, hybrid lens that is approved for the treatment of all different refractive errors, but specifically for keratoconus. And then it has, throughout the years, it has definitely changed. It uh, has new, has a second generation came about in 2013 with the Ultra Health lens. Um, and there um, are new, always going to be new uh, additions to um, this lens and line extensions to hybrid lenses. There are several companies um, in the, uh, the, well, first of all, the, uh, Synergize is the only company that has an approved lens in the United States and is the only lens that is available in the United States to treat um, all refractive air, including keratoconus and post-surgical eyes or irregular corneas. Um, but there are some lenses that are available outside of the United States. Um, Hybrid is in France and Airflex Swiss Lens is in Switzerland. 
Now we know that today there are many doctors who are fitting scleral lenses for hyper for keratoconus. In fact, 70% of the patients are kind of being transitioned into that lens. But hybrid lenses still encompass almost 12% of the United States market. Um, and so they are uh, still a very popular lens. And it is one of the high, number one indications to use a hybrid lens that is keratoconus. So it's, you know, there are several indications for hitting hybrid lenses on irregular corneas. As I mentioned before, because of this gas permeable hard lens, it will correct high amounts of corneal tericity, and it doesn't have to be regular astigmatism, you know, the kind that could be corrected in glasses, could be irregular. Um, it's got an improvement over soft toric lenses because it doesn't depend on it being situated in the right position. It could rotate all over and it, it won't matter. The patient will have clear vision. Now, the soft skirt of this hybrid lens helps with centration. And so some patients who did well in gas permeable lenses um, vision-wise, but couldn't keep the lens in place, will have that benefit of that lens not dislodging. In fact, tonight I had a patient who I fit in a hybrid lens for keratoconus, and she mentioned she works with kids who often frequently hit, them, hit her in the eye or whatever. And so this is a great option for her because that lens is going to stay stable and it's not going to dislodge because of sudden movements or anything like that. It's definitely more comfortable than just a gas permeable lens. And um, again, it's it's less expensive than having to use two different lenses and you don't have to have uh, uh, multiple solutions for the patient. And it's also an alternative for patients who do not look like they're gonna be a good candidate for scleral contact lenses, um, possibly because they can't handle the lenses or it's not available to them, uh, their doctor's not comfortable fitting it or just cost in general. So there is some reluctance by doctors, though, to fit hybrid contact lenses. And so it's, you know, it's up to you to ask the doctor, what are my options and, and is this an option for me? Now, some of the some some doctors might not feel comfortable fitting it because they just don't fit a lot of keratoconus patients or they're not used to fitting hybrid lenses or they're also they might be used to some of the complications that we saw in those very early generations of hybrid lenses that have pretty much been eliminated today and there is a little bit of art to fitting hybrid lenses it's definitely a science and um, but we have to we have to be open to fitting all these different things and this is what I was talking about some of the lenses in the past might cause some blood vessels to grow on the cornea or cause abrasions of the front surface of the eye. But those are hybrids of years ago, of decades ago, actually. The newer generation hybrid lenses actually have a gas permeable material in the center of the lens that has a very high oxygen content. Um, and the, so the skirt that surrounds it, that soft material is made of silicone, and so that has a high oxygen com com component. Many of these lenses are also treated with hydropeg. Hydropeg makes that lens more wettable. Um, makes the lens a little slippery, but it definitely makes it more wettable for the patient. Um, these lenses also have UVA and UVB blockers on them. But more important, they also have this hyperbond junction. And the hyperbond junction is actually what keeps the soft and the hard lens together. And the reason why that's important is because in the past, some of those lenses and some of the lenses that are available overseas have a problem with splitting. But this is actually a covalent bond. So that means it's at the molecular level. So this, this lens works as a unit, one full unit. And the, you could put so much stretching on this lens, you could actually stretch the lens out of shape so it's not really functional, and it it really and it won't even break apart at that bond. So um, any normal cleaning that one would do of a hybrid lens is not going to tear or break that bond. So patients who benefit from hybrid lenses, again, are patients who might need bifocals or who have astigmatism, but of course, um, you know, patients who even have dry eye or just kind of funky little funky corneas, meaning cor patients who might have mild keratoconus to moderate keratoconus. Uh, or it could be patients like like you and me. Um, by the way, that's my eye there, and I'm wearing hybrid lenses myself. I don't have keratoconus, but I wear them because I like the acuity that I get it, because I love the sharpness of a gas permeable lens, and I also need bifocals, and so these lenses give a great bifocal prescription for me.
There are a lot of studies out there that show the benefits of hybrid contact lenses, uh, very much so on, uh, on uh, keratoconus patients as well. Uh, this study showed that there's an increased lens comfort and toler tolerability versus gas permeable lenses, um, higher quality of vision as well, um, I'm sorry, quality of life scores when wearing these compared to gas permeable lenses. And the way this lens fits is it, it vaults the apex or the steep part of the cornea. Um, and so it doesn't rub against that, por that cornea. So it doesn't, in it doesn't induce corneal scarring. These are some of the lenses that Synergize makes for hybrid for keratoconus patients. Um, the most most uh, modern one is the Ultra Health and the uh, Ultra Health FC. Um, so we uh, most doctors are fitting those. And again, this is like an image that at the front surface of when the doctor puts that green dye in your eye that you love. Um, that green dye tells us where there's fluid and where there's space between the lens and the cornea. And so you can see the straight on view. There's a lot of space in the middle, a lot of fluid there, and then it kind of thins out a little bit. And so we can kind of see that tear flow there. Um, but more important, as we move to the the, uh, the left-hand portion of the screen, there's that soft cushion, and that means that the soft lens is actually what rests or sit on, sits on the cornea, and I'm sorry, on the eye. And so that's why it's more comfortable, because it's sitting on the, the white part of the eye as opposed to sitting on the corneal tissue. And here's an I ideal fit, about 130 microns of clearance there. We also want the lens to move. So when the pay, when we we when you come in, we ask you to blink. And the nice thing about this movement is it flushes tears tears underneath it. And so that allows for good nutrition to the eye. It allows for good oxygen, and it just keeps cleaning the lens every time you you blink. Now, we doctor will fit you using uh, trial lenses, or this is what's really cool, and I did this tonight with two of my patients. We took those images, we took those topography images uh, that we showed you earlier, and I will plug that into a system, and I will call my consultant, and without even putting a lens on your eye in the office, we can design a lens for you, and um, then that will be dispensed, and most often that lens is the final lens. Maybe we might need to update it, maybe we you might have to fine tune it a little bit, um, but it's really been very beneficial. And this is kind of a demonstration of what we would look like if we put a, tri a lens on the eye without actually putting a lens on your eye. And so we just take that information, we practice, and we come up with a lens design that works for you. And so it's really kind of nice. Now you're probably also asking me, oh my gosh, there's there's a soft lens, there's a hard uh, a gas permeable lens. How do I take care of this lens? And that's a really good question to ask because it's very important um, that you understand um, that we have to, we want to make it simple for you. First of all, with any contact lens, never, ever, never, ever, ever use tap water on that contact lens. Either if it's a soft lens, a gas perm, a scleral, tap water in the eye do not go well, okay? Uh, the standard of care is uh, for treating, um, for wearing, using any lens that, um, a hybrid lens is, is either a, a multi-purpose solution or a pro hydrogen peroxide system. Now we know that lenses that are being worn more than once, meaning non-disposable, do benefit from having a digital cleaning, meaning using your finger and rubbing that lens. And that could be done after removal of the lens or prior to insertion. Um, that's how I use it for myself. Um, you could use uh, a number of multi-purpose solutions. Uh, the one that we do not recommend though is Revital Lens because it does change the shape of the skirt. Uh, we do want to avoid uh, some peroxide systems um, that have hydroclear in them um, if, uh, if the lens has that coating of that THP. Uh, there is a system called Tangible Clean Multipurpose System that is approved for hybrid lenses that have that THP coating on it. You can use lubricating drops with it. Um, the, we don't want to use it too viscous um, because it is like a soft lens as well, so keep away from that. And if you are taking drops for medic Medicaid, prescribed drops for allergy or for glaucoma, you don't want to put those drops in while you're wearing the lens. It has to be before or after. And when you put the lens in the eye, you're gonna fill the bowl of the lens with a couple drops of either saline or multi-purpose solution. Uh, you don't have to fill it up to the rim, but at least three or four drops, it works well. And um, 
when we, we put that lens on, because you have that drop in there, it, that's what will be absorbed by the eye. And I'll show you some images in a minute. And these lenses should be rec uh, should need to be replaced every six months. So typically a patient will get um, two pairs when they uh, get them from their doctor. When you're holding the lens uh, before you're inserting it, you could hold it with two fingers, or you could use three fingers, that's the tripod method, or you could use some of these different ring inserters um, or a DMV. These are some of the di devices that scleral lens patients use, and I type typically like to think of it as a scleral lens because it is. There's just some images of patients putting the lens in. And you know, sometimes people are just a little intimidated by the fact that there's two parts to this lens. But believe me, I've had patients with all different types of fingers, sizes, and fingernails um, who are able to get this lens in using different devices. So let's uh, talk, let's, let me show you a video about how we insert hybrid lenses. Um, and again, uh, one of the things that I do want to recommend is uh, the most important thing is, is putting that lens in. Try not to put it in like that Im image in the middle uh, looking up. And we'll just move to the video and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, so here's a video that talks about duet, um, but it's this, that, which is for regular corneas, but uh, a hybrid for keratoconus lenses for care to close patients, it's the same way. It's a good idea to handle your lenses in the same order each day so you don't get them mixed up. Simply place the lens on the tip of your finger, hold down on your lower lid, and gently place the lens on your eye. Slowly release your eyelid and blink several times. Now let's go over how to take out your lenses. Wet lenses do not bend in the middle, so it needs to be removed with a narrow pinch, like removing a piece of lint from your clothing. Begin by pulling your upper lid back with one hand and use the ring finger on your opposite hand to pull down your lower lid. Be sure to dry your fingers before removing the next lens. So that's easy as pie, right? One of the things I really want to emphasize is that when you're putting it in is that you do put it in a, a like parallel. So you should be looking at a mirror on the table and your head it should be parallel to that because these lenses do have a little weight to them and so uh, rather than having it slip off this is easier. You also fill it up with some solution as I mentioned before with some saline or with the MPS multipurpose solution. The reason why is because that solution um, if you have dry fingers and you have that solution in that the bowl of the lens, that solution will be loved by your eye and your eye will just gently take that solution and suck it onto itself. And you don't have to worry about pushing too hard onto the eye. You wanted to just kind of use capillary attraction for that lens to suck on. Obviously keeping your eye as wide open as possible and gently relaxing the lids. Now, removing the hybrid lens can sometimes be a challenge and uh, for some people, un uh, unless you have a doctor or a te tech or a staff who will spend some time with you and teach you how to put them in and take them out properly. So one of the things that you wanna do is you could practice. Um, as mentioned, you wanna have your fingers as um, uh, like little pinchers on your fingers and you don't wanna be grabbing the lens at uh, three and nine o'clock. You wanna grab it like at, as if it's at five and seven o'clock. You could practice just pinching it off of your finger like this so that you can get the feel. You kind of bring your, your, your pinching off at the soft portion of the lens, but it's going to kind of feel the hard part of the lens as well. And so again, put make that little OK sign with your fingers and then bring your fingers close to your eye and position them so that they're um, going to be taking the lens off the soft with the soft portion and lift it away gently. Again, fingers dry, dry, dry as best as possible and it will make it much easier. Now, if you have a challenge with doing that, there is something called the tissue method, um, and you can use a tissue just to easily, gently remove that lens. And I know it sounds weird, but it works very well. And of course, your lens is gonna be disinfected afterwards, so you don't have to worry about little particles. And to show you how easy it is, I'm gonna share with this uh, video of a good friend of mine and colleague who fits these lenses regularly. It can offer superior vision and comfort over any other contact lens on the market. 
I know because I wear and love this lens. So I want to offer it to any patient that's eligible for it, and I want them to be successful. So in one of my cases, I had a precious little eight-year-old girl who truly struggled with insertion and removal. She kind of got insertion, and that happened after many, many visits, but removal was just very difficult for her. In her own words, the tissue technique was kind of weird. So what really resonated with her is when I took the time to put my own lens in and take my own lens out in front of her, and we kind of did it together. So sometimes you just have to get in the trenches and show patients how easy it is, how uncomplicated it can be, even though it seems a little overwhelming at first. It's not too bad. And there you go. I hope that helps. I absolutely love Dr. Tucker, and I, that's exactly how um, I would teach a patient as well. And now, if, if as I mentioned before, there's a little bit of troubleshooting um, for uh, comments here I'm going to make. If you push that lens on too hard when you're inserting it, you could cause an abrasion. And this is just an example of a colleague of mine who shared this patient. A patient puts this lens on, and you can see where that dark band is in the middle, that's because they put the patient pushed the lens on too hard and caused a slight abrasion. When the doctor puts it on, the lens fits perfectly. And so it's important, again, for sometimes for us to watch you put those lenses on so we could figure out what the problems and the issues are. And also you can get this vacuum. And so if you look at the top picture, or if you look at the bottom picture, you're gonna see that there's a there's nice space in between the contact lens and the cornea. However, if a patient puts that lens on a little too hard, it could suck onto there, it could cause a vacuum, and sometimes a patient will experience blurred vision throughout the day. So we have to be careful. Trapped bubbles um, can occur, and that's maybe because there's bubbles in the solution. This is, happens to be my eye, again, and um, they're not dangerous, but they are uncomfortable for the day, so we need to get those out. And some patients will experience this skirt discoloration. It's a buildup of calcium inside the soft portion of the lens, and it doesn't happen on um, many patients, but occasionally a patient will have a lot of that in their tear film, and then with combination of certain solutions, they, they create this. It doesn't cause any damage to the, to the eye, however, it should be replaced or the system should be changed. Now, last thing I just want to mention is, um, remember how I talked about empirical fitting. Um, here is a patient, an example of a patient who has a very advanced keratoconus. And when you look at that, you can see um, that it, it has a lot of red, again, on that map. And the patient failed with corneal GPs and um, the, because they were uncomfortable, probably because the lens was slipping. And so the doctor wanted to fit a hybrid lens. However, uh, we did uh, a consult with this and we did that empirical fit, again, Remember, that means that we don't have to put trial lenses on the patient. We just look at the maps and we can tell if a patient's a good candidate or not as well. And this patient was not because no matter what design we came up with, it was going to bear onto the cornea. And so this is a patient who would do much better wearing a scleral lens. And so I'm going to leave you with this, and that is that um, hybrids are very effective contact lenses for patients who have cornea, or who have normal eyes or normal corneas, I should say, but also who have irregular uh, corneas, then such as keratoconus, and it fits. It works best in patients who have mild to moderate disease. Um, the benefit of them is that you know, again, they are comfortable. They center well. The optics are really nice. It's easier. It, it takes less visits to fit a hybrid lens than it does a scleral lens in many cases, and it, it does allow for tears to be exchanged on the blank. They don't. They don't stay in there. There are some patients who wear scleral lenses who get stagnation of their tears. And so they do get cloudy vision. So that's some of the pros. Now, the cons of fitting hybrid lenses and why you would may want to fit a scleral lens is, again, if there's maybe their sclera is very asymmetric um, or uh, they are, have more advanced disease. So those are indications there. This is an example of a patient who I had been fitting for years in a hybrid lens, how, and she was very successful. However, at some point her disease did progress, and um, we were able uh, not to able to wear hybrid lenses at this point. Um, and so she was refit, and fortunately, Synergize also ha fits a, has a scleral lens uh, called the VS, and she was very successful wearing that and doing quite well. 
So um, at this point, um, I would like to open it up to questions. And if Dr. Chu has, uh, would like to pose any for me, I could do my best to answer them for you. Mary, are there any questions that? Uh... Hi, Dr. Scafani. That was a great presentation. I did get a, a few questions. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Perfect. All right, let me get the questions that I sent. First of all, this is one. Uh, <clears throat> where can I find a list of doctors who fits uh, uh, Synergize? So if you look on the Synergize website, there is uh, some information for patients. Uh, there's a, a link for patients, and that will link hook you up with a doctor in your area that fits Synergize lenses. Great. Here's and another of course, question. you could always reach out to me if you uh, can't find somebody. I will find somebody in your region. <laughs> uh, this is a question that I think you answered, but maybe you want to revisit it. Is a scleral lens, a, is a hybrid lens different from a scleral lens? Yes, so um, scleral lenses are made of a rigid gas permeable material. Uh, and so the entire lens is actually um, a hard lens. I, I don't like to use the word hard, but it's, it is a hard lens. Whereas a hybrid lens has a center core that is gas permeable, and it's about um, 8.5 millimeters in diameter. And then it's surrounded by a skirt of soft lens material, and the whole overall diameter is about 14.5 millimeters. So hybrid lenses are about 14 and a half millimeters, and scleral lenses can range from 14 and a half to 22 millimeters. Uh, so they're bigger. Now, do you have to fill the bowl with liquid like you do with a scleral? Yes, you do want to fill the bowl, but not fully. You know, with a scleral lens, you almost want to see it kind of bulging at the top, like a, a, a con convex on the top. Um, with a, a hybrid lens, you're going to fill it with some saline, but not so much, about three or four drops. Okay. Uh, here's another question. If my cones are low, will a hybrid work for me, or will it just go to the bulgiest part of my eye, which is not my line of vision? That's that's a great question. So like any hard material, um, as long as the gas permeable portion is covering it, um, it will correct that irregular astigmatism for you. So um, there are patients who have extremely low cones. And when I when you say low, there's two different terms. I'm going to answer two different ways. So if you mean your keratoconus is low or your cone is low, meaning it's not advanced, meaning it doesn't protrude a real lot, you're a great candidate for it. And patients who have keratoconus that's more centered do even better. However, if it is really low, um, you might not be the best candidate for it. There are, there are certain hybrid lenses that work better. They call them the FC design that might work for you. Um, but you, your doctor would have to determine if you're a good candidate. Okay. Again, remember that the lens is centered better. The lens is centered on by the, the sclera, by the soft portion. Okay, so low can mean mild uh -huh. or low can mean where it's located. Yes. Oh, great, great. Here's a question. I'm so sorry. Yay. My computer literally shut off and I was like, oh no, it's time for questions. Okay. I, let so let me ask one more and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Chu. And that was a this is an interesting one. How can you tell if your hard lenses are causing scarring before it occurs? So that's a general question, right? Because it could be for a ga corneal gas permeable lens or intralumbal lens or even a scleral at the worst or a hybrid. So, um, we, so the rule is we don't really want the lens to ever really touch the cornea. Um, there, when I first started practicing, um, we that's how keratoconus patients were fit. That lens was pushing down on the cornea in hopes um, that it would prevent progression of the disease. Well, in fact, the CLEC study is a long-term study that showed that that actually causes scarring. Um, so we don't want to fit any type of lens that way, whether it be a corneal gas permeable lens or a scleral or a hybrid lens. We want to stay off the cornea. Completely agreed. 
So I'm going to take it over from here, but you're going to help me uh, and let me know if you've already had these questions. Um, someone asked about oxygen permeability between sclerals and hybrids. Did you talk about the differences there? Yeah, so the uh, the permeability of a uh of the new generation hybrid lenses is very high. Uh, I think we showed an image showed an image of uh, what the DK was. The soft, the skirt, and the gas perm are a little bit different, but they are high. Now we know that scleral lenses also have a variety of what a DK can be too. The difference, though, is with a scleral lens, you know, the lens we don't translate tears, meaning the tears just stay underneath it all day. Whereas with a hybrid lens, there is a tear pump, and so that tear pump also that your tears contain oxygen as well and so even though the new generation hybrid lenses have a lot of oxygen that goes through them you also get oxygen through the tears that get pumped every time you blink excellent thank you for that and excuse you. me for that Bless you. okay so next question here um so you know as you know patient preference really kind of affects the best type of lens for them. And so I have a lot of questions that are kind of individualized and I'm guessing it's due to the varying disease stages that our patients have. Mm -hmm. So I have a question here, you know, my regarding the confidence level about this patient's ability with different types of lenses. So this patient, feels most confident with hard lenses, but they're uncomfortable, but they're less confident. And I'm guessing in like the handling with, you know, hybrid and soft lenses and, and least with glasses. So, you know, you've kind of discussed where you would recommend hybrid lenses for the more mild to moderate, and then perhaps scleral lenses for the more advanced shapes that are more asymmetric how would a patient, you know, know, you know, aside from what their doctor is telling them and recommending, you know, how can a patient kind of decide maybe what is the type, best type of lens for them? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, patients who, we all know that scleral lenses can be used for any stage of the disease, right? Uh, we can put it on normal corneas too. Um, so that kind of takes that off the, the, the shelf because we know that it works for all different stages of keratoconus. Whereas hybrid lenses work better for patients who have early to moderate disease. And one of the reasons why, you know, we want to catch keratoconus early, and that's why, you know, we had that discussion earlier about early diagnosis and the potential for doing different procedures such as cross-linking to keep patients at the mild to moderate phase, this gives them the opportunity to wear all different types of lenses then. They aren't married to a scleral lens or they aren't married to a hybrid lens. They could wear all different types of varieties if we could keep those patients at the early phase of the disease. So that's our, our goal with that. Um, and I can't remember the question now. What was <laughs> It was kind of, you know, like how, what uh, tips would a patient have to well, maybe help guide them? Like, is a soft lens better for me? A hybrid better yeah. for me? A scleral, like what, you know, how can a patient help kind of influence yeah. their process? So, um, so for example, for, I, I, I typically don't suggest a soft lens unless um, the disease is going, we know is going to be stable because it gives them a little bit of false impression that that lens is going to last a lifetime. There are some good soft lenses that might work for keratoconus patient, but not, not a lot. Um, so with regards to, you know, selecting a lens, it, it has to do with your lifestyle and how you can handle them. If you can't handle the lens, if you can't put it in or take it out, it's not going to work for you. We want to mm -hmm. make it successful for you. We want to make sure that, you know, things are, are easy for you to handle and that it fits in your lifestyle. I have a, I had a, a patient today who works with toddlers and she was mentioning, you know, I'm really worried about getting hit in the eye and my lens coming out of my eye. I really need to make sure that this is a lens that is going to be comfortable all day and it's not going to move around. And, and that was that's where hybrid would come in handy for that patient. So I have another question here. As you know, keratoconus is an asymmetric um, disease. It affects typically one eye more than the other. So someone asked, you know, if you're using a scleral lens in one eye, 
do you recommend glasses or or what if the other eye doesn't need a scleral lens? So can you talk a little bit about how you might mix and match or what yep. your experience is with that? Can a patient wear a hybrid lens in one eye and a scleral in the other? Yeah, so you know, you just described what I call a unicone, right? So um, these are patients that have it more worse, worse in one eye than the other. Um, yeah, I have patients who wear different modalities all the time. You know, um, there are many who, if 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 a scleral lens is the only lens of choice for them, um, for one eye, particular eye, quite often they just want to have a scleral in both eyes, and I think it's a, it's a good option there. You know, I I I prescribe scleral lenses and hybrid lenses, and I it's really individual for these patients. We Completely. still fit, and we still fit small corneal GPs on patients. Yeah. I have a lot of patients who really love those lenses, and I love it when they come in. Still, <laughs> absolutely. You know, yeah. I think we're so lucky because we have so many contact lens options that work for different stages of keratoconus, from yeah. mild and soft and toric lenses, and you know, glasses really do work well for mild yeah. patients. Yeah. And and then we have hybrids we have piggyback we have sclerals it's just i think really exciting that we have so many tools to really individualize vision correction for all of our keratoconus patients so i'm going to close with one question here and i don't think you've discussed it maybe you have but where can patients um are there any resources where patients can find uh optometrists who are experienced with fitting hybrid lenses Yes, I believe that on the Synergize website, um, you can find uh, a resource of doctors in the location. You can put in your the, where you live and, and that. Obviously, you could always reach out to the National Keratoconus Foundation or to Synergize to find a doctor in that region. Great. And you know, a lot of other questions that we received, you already answered them. You talked okay. about differences between a hybrid and a scleral. We know a hybrid has a soft and rigid portion. Um, and yeah, you know, I think we've covered it all. Even uh, yeah. there was a patient having trouble removing them. And I love the tissue technique. Oh, I've yeah. never heard of that. Oh, and really? So I, yeah. 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 I've definitely learned something new today. Oh, one more thing. You know, I saw the video where the the patient put this the hybrid lens directly on, and then I saw a video where they fill it with the saline. Yeah. I've always instructed my patients to put a few drops of preservative-free saline or an artificial tear inside. So do you prefer putting the fluid in before application? Without a doubt, yes. So yeah. the, the, the um, a couple other things about hybrids I just want to mention too. So you know, hybrid lenses are are good for patients who don't have keratoconus as well. That's something that's really important to know. I wear them. I am a uh, I wear, I'm a presbyopic patient, meaning I need to wear reading glasses, and so they're very comfortable um, and clear vision for me. Yes, you do need to fill out the bowl with something. Uh, you don't just put it on dry. It's going to be very uncomfortable and will create a suction if you do that. So you do need to put a few drops of, uh, of saline in the, in the well before you put the lens in. Perfect. Do we have one more slide here in your slide deck? I believe we do. All right. Well, I just want to thank you, Dr. Sclafani. You are just a wonderful wealth of information. That was such an informative talk, and I know that it was helpful for a lot of our listeners today, and even those who are going to be watching the recording later on. So thank you for, you know, being with us here this evening, and I just want to ask all of our um, other people here joining us, um, our next webinar is going to be on May 9th. And the title is Risk Factors for Keratoconus. Our speaker will be Dr. Mundy from the Ohio State University. And uh, again, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you all for being here today and spending this last hour with us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in two months. Again, thank you, Dr. Sclafani. You're amazing. And it was so good to see you tonight. Bye, it's everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you.